pleasure today to uh, have Chester from Weizmann give a talk about monopoles. Um, so Weizmann in Israel. Um, Shai did his PhD under Sylvia Pufu at Princeton University. Um, and then Shai, can you tell me if you did a postdoc or you directly moved to Weizmann? Uh, no, I, I'm currently a postdoc at Weizmann. Oh, you're a postdoc. Yeah. I already upgraded you to a faculty status, so. <laughs> but, so then you're a postdoc at Weizmann. Um, and that, that's your transition from Princeton yeah, yeah, to, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing my first postdoc currently. Perfect. Um, and so Shai has been involved in various aspects of gauge theories. Um, so monopole operators, uh, the bootstrap, some string theory aspects, including holography and large end spring mills. Um, but today he'll be focusing on monopoles and non spur symmetric uh, quantum ultradynamics. Um, so Shai, thanks for accepting to give a seminar. I know it's late for you in Israel, but uh, we look forward to hearing uh, the rest of your talk. Great. Um, uh, th thank you for the invite. Um, and I, I guess I will just uh, jump right in. So this is based on a recent paper from a couple of months ago, but also many previous papers by me as well as other authors, which I will mention uh, throughout the talk. Um, OK, um, so let's begin by motivating why we are interested in monopole operators in, um, in three-dimensional quantum electrodynamics. So uh, the first motivation um, is nature. Uh, it's, it should be in any physics talk. So uh, monopole operators are order parameters uh, for condensed matter systems, which are believed to be described by uh, QED3 coupled to either N scalars or N fermions. Uh, so to give a couple examples, um, so uh, fermionic QED3 with four fermions is believed to describe a certain algebraic Dirac spin liquid, uh, which may describe the phase transition in a certain material. Um, which is something I read in a condensed matter paper. So you guys are probably know more about this than I would. Um, I, another example of a possible experimental relation is that the scalar version of QED3 is, uh, describes the VBS phase transition in quantum antiferromagnetics uh, for various N. Uh, and this is based on the constant work by Sashtev and Reed. So I, I should note that as far as I'm aware, um, neither of these um, theoretical constructions um, have been like concretely yet matched to experiments because I still think it's an ongoing question to have an experimental system that is well described by QED3, uh, but this is a very active uh, field of research. Uh, and so like the hope is that within a few years, there could be precise comparisons between uh, theoretical predictions and these experiments. Um, okay, so that's the first motivation. Uh, the second motivation is that you can think of fermionic QED3 as a simpler analog of quantum chromodynamics in four dimensions. Um, so in particular, um, one similarity uh, between both systems uh, is that QCD4, when the number of fermions is low, it confines, you know, as, as everyone knows. Um, and similarly, it turns out that for fermionic QED3, it also shows confinement when the number of fermions is small. So in particular, um, in the case of zero fermions, it was proven that the theory confines by Polyakov in a classic work from, I believe, the 70s. Um, and in particular, he showed that it confines due to proliferation of monopoles, uh, exactly the kind of monopoles I'll be describing in this talk. Um, for n bigger than zero, uh, it is not known exactly for what value confinement happens, and this is an open question in the literature, um, of which I will be able to briefly say something about during this talk. Um, the third motivation is a bit more formal, and this relates to a recently conjectured web of dualities between various 3D conformal field theories, um, some of which are QED3 and some of which are just free theories. And in many of these dualities, monopole operators play a very fundamental role because they are the most basic operator in the theory, which is then mapped to other operators in the dual theory. So these are the three motivations for why one should study monopole operators in QED3. Um, I, I've used some technical language so far about CFTs, but don't worry. I'm going to give uh, some uh, introductory discussion of them for those who might be less familiar uh, with these concepts. Um, okay, so um, I was told this was a more general audience, and so I prepared a few slides just giving a very gentle introduction to conformal field theory, starting with quantum field theory. Um, so let's start with just relativistic um, Euclidean quantum field theory. So we define this theory on Rd, so D is the number of space-time dimensions, 
And because it's relativistic, it has Poincaré symmetry. Um, so in particular, that means the theory is invariant under translations. And then it's also invariant under rotations, where because I'm considering a Euclidean quantum field theory for simplicity, these are literally just rotations in D space dimensions. So if I was dealing with the Lorentzian case, then you, there would also be a time direction, but I'm just dealing with only spatial directions for simplicity. So the basic object in a quantum field theory are states, such as the vacuum, and then operators, uh, which act on those states, or for examples of operators being, say, electric field or magnetization. So you label these operators by the symmetries of the theory. So, um, so far, we've discussed translations and rotations. And so because the theory is translation invariant, that means you can label the operator by position x. And then because the theory has rotational invariance, um, there is another quantum number called spin, um, which has to be a half integer value. Um, and so as you see, I'm, I label this operator by position x, as well as this half integer j, which you call the spin. Um, the quantities you then study in a, in a quantum field theory, physical observables, are correlation functions of these operators. Um, so for instance, one of the simplest examples is a two-point function. So here you see you have uh, the vacuum on either side, and then you've inserted two operators, one in point x, one in point y. And this measures the correlation between response of the system to sources at position x and at position y. So, so this is a very quick one-slide review of quantum field theory. So you have states, you have operators, and then you're computing uh, correlation functions. And those are the uh, physical observables we're going to be talking about. Um, OK. So now we can go from quantum field theory to a conformal field theory, which is a special case of quantum field theory, which has two additional space-time symmetries. So that means in addition to translations and rotations, we now have dilations, which is where you simply multiply a function of x by a number a. And then you have inversions, which is where you invert uh, this vector x um, as such. So now um, our operators, instead of being labeled just by spin and the position x, they now have a third label called the scaling dimension, um, which corresponds to the dilation invariance. So in particular, if this operator is a scalar, i.e. if its spin is zero, um, then you can very precisely define the scaling dimension as how this operator changes under um, dilation. So here you put this number a, um, and then you can take a out of the operator, and it comes with the power of delta, where delta is the scaling dimension of the operator. Um, so, so this delta, um, like spin, is a, uh, one of the fundamental quantum numbers that defines the operator. Um, and this delta, in fact, has some very general properties you can show. So it has a lower bound, which follows from demanding unitarity of the theory, which is something we usually ask of most well-defined conformal field theories. Uh, and this bound takes a very simple form. So if it's a scalar operator, then this is the bound, where d is the space-time dimension. And if it's a spinning operator, uh, where I'm just going to deal with integer spin for simplicity, then it takes this form. So you see these are um, bounds. So you could ask the question, what happens if the scaling dimension saturates the bound? So um, for operators with integer spin, if it saturates the bound, i.e. if delta is d minus 2 plus j, then that means the operator is conserved. Um, so uh, an example which appears in all um, local CFTs is the stress tensor operator. So this has spin 2 and dimension equal to the space-time dimension. Um, and this stress tensor is conserved. And so this is just the familiar stress tensor you know, from, from undergrad physics. Uh, and here it appears again in the context of conformal field theory. Um, OK, great. Um, so, so that's a very quick one slide introduction to the symmetries that define a conformal field theory. Um, now let's talk about some effects of conformal symmetry on operators, which, as I've said, are kind of the basic building blocks of any quantum field theory. So in a quantum field theory, states evolve through time and are defined on spatial slices orthogonal to that time, while local operators are defined just at one space-time point. So in a general quantum field theory, states and operators are very different objects. You know, they're kind of defined on totally different spaces. Uh, in a conformal field theory, though, uh, because we, because the theory is invariant under conformal transformations, that means in particular, you can transform a theory from being on RD, which is just D, um, you know, uh, you know, parallel lines, basically, uh, you can transform that to the cylinder. So here, S is a sphere. Uh, now it's D minus 1 times R. So in particular, this is literally a cylinder in the case of uh, D equals to 2, because uh, then you would just have a circle times a line. And when D is bigger than 2, you have to imagine some kind of generalization of a cylinder. 
Uh, but mathematically speaking, it's very simple what you're doing. So here you take the metric on RD, which you can write in these um, you know, uh, cylindrical coordinates like so. And then you can factor out this overall factor, um, redefining tau in terms of R, which is the radial direction. And now you see that the metric on RD is the same thing as an overall factor times the metric on R cross SD minus one. Um, but the definition of two metrics being conformally invariant or, or conformally related is that they are just equal to each other up to some overall factor. And so this is why there is a conformal transformation going from RD to this cylinder. Um, okay, so, um, so what can we use this fact for, the fact that RD is related to the cylinder? So uh, firstly, uh, dilations on RD after you go to the cylinder now correspond to shifts of this variable tau. Remember, tau is related to the logarithm of this radial direction. Um, and so what that implies is that you can take a state S and you can shift tau to the origin of the cylinder so that a state defined at a single point can then be identified with a local operator acting on the vacuum. Um, and you can do this uh, for any point, you know, because it's a cylinder. So you can always just uh, shift to go to the center of the cylinder. And so what this means is that uh, now there can be a one-to-one -one correspondence between local operators and states. Um, and so, you know, just to emphasize this only happens in a theory with conformal invariance, because in a theory without conformal invariance, you know, as mentioned in the first bullet point, your state would be defined on entire spatial slice. And it's only because of, it's only because we have this dilation symmetry that we can basically take an entire spatial slice and shrink it to one point, such that we can then identify it with an operator. Um, and, and that's how you get the famous state operator correspondence, which is one of the defining features of a conformal field theory. Um, so in particular, um, this state operator correspondence implies that the scaling dimension of an operator in RD is the same thing as the energy of the state that corresponds to that operator on the cylinder. So like this is another way of saying that the Hamiltonian on RD, uh, whose quantum number is, I'm oh, sorry, that the, the dilation um, generator on RD, whose quantum number is the scaling dimension, gets related to the Hamiltonian operator on the cylinder, whose quantum number is the energy. Um, okay, so, so any questions so far about this uh, introductory material? Um, okay, great. So hopefully um, everyone is following to some extent. Um, okay, um, so uh, now let's just talk about the simplest example of a conformal field theory to make some of these ideas uh, concrete. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so the simplest example is a free theory. So we can consider n complex scalar fields phi, where this index i goes from one to n, and this, and then you can write down uh, the partition function, i.e., the path integral for this theory. So here you see it's a path integral over this field phi. And then in the action, we have the usual kinetic term uh, plus a possible quartic interaction with coefficient lambda. And this theory is invariant under un because you can multiply this phi by matrix un and this action remains invariant. So this path integral can describe two CFTs actually. So the first CFT is if we just define lambda to be zero, then this is a free theory. And this is in fact conformally invariant for any space-time dimension d. Um, a somewhat more interesting CFT you can also define is if you take lambda goes to infinity, then if the space-time dimension is between two and four, then this describes uh, something called the uh, critical UN model, which is an interacting CFT. Now, the reason why this is a CFT when lambda goes to infinity is because when the space-time dimension is between two and four, then this quartic operator is irrelevant. And so that means under RG flow, it is natural that its coefficient would go to infinity. Um, okay, so there is a mathematical trick you can do to study this um, critical CFT with the quartic uh, operator, which is that you can replace the quartic operator by a quadratic operator at the cost of introducing a scalar. So this is called the hubbard stratonovich trick. So here you see that in the path integral, we now also have a path integral over a real scalar sigma uh, but now the action is just quadratic in phi. So we have sigma phi squared minus sigma squared over four lambda. And so you can check that the equations of motion for sigma just give you back the original path integral. So the sigma is basically acting like a Lagrange multiplier. Because also note that there is no kinetic term for the sigma. You know, it, it's just literally just a Lagrange multiplier. So um, this hubbard stratonovich trick is particularly useful if you want to consider the, C, the critical C of T which recall is when lambda goes to infinity. Because in that case, you can simply just drop 
the sigma square term. And then the action for the critical C of T is just these two terms. And so this is a much simpler language than the quartic language, in which case you have to carry around this kind of, you know, infinite coefficient with you. Um, okay. Um, so, so, so far I've just been discussing the free theory as well as a, the critical theory, but I haven't discussed QED3 yet. To discuss QED3, I now take the UN global symmetry and I gauge the, a U1 subgroup and that will give me scalar QED3. Um, and so in particular, I will have left over the SUN global symmetry, but I no longer have the U1 because that's been gauged. And that, that's what I will discuss next. And that's the main subject of this talk. Okay. So now we just take this path integral of the critical theory and we add a gauge field for the U1 subgroup. So here you have um, the, the action you now get. So this first term is the kinetic term for an abelian gauge field. So this is the field strength F squared divided by E, which is the coupling to uh, the gauge field. You have the usual kinetic term for the scalars, but now D is a covariant derivative. So now it depends on the gauge field A. Um, you have the usual uh, qu uh, quartic terms written in terms of the hubbard schwartanovich field from the previous slide. And then lastly, we've included a term you can construct out of the gauge field specifically in three dimensions, which is called the term Simon's term. And this has coefficient k. And this is something we can only do in 3D because otherwise you can't write down this kind of term. Okay, so, um, so he here's the action for scalar QED3, but, but we want to look at the C of T. So we want to look at the critical scalar QED3. So it was shown in a classic work uh, a number of years ago that at least at large n, you can flow in the IR to C of T by having E go to infinity. And so the reason why E is going to infinity is very similar to the reason why lambda went to infinity, which is that this one over E squared is multiplying F squared. And F squared is an irrelevant term. Um, and so that means that its coefficient should be going to zero, i.e. one over its coefficient should be going to infinity. Um, and so that means all we do to get the C of T is we take this action and we just get rid of this term. The same way we also got rid of the sigma squared term um, by having lambda goes to infinity. Um, and so this might seem a little bit funny to have a gauge theory which doesn't have a kinetic term, uh, but that shouldn't be so surprising. I mean, first of all, the, kinetic, the, the gauge field will still show up in the covariant derivative. It still shows up in the chern simons term. And in a sense, the gauge field is kind of analogous to this hubbard stratonovich term, which also didn't have a kinetic term but nonetheless has non-trivial effects on the dynamics. Um, I should note that there's actually two kinds of scalar QED3 C of Ts that you can define uh, because you can choose whether or not to have a quartic interaction. So if you want, you could tune lambda equals zero, in which case you would just wouldn't have a quartic interaction. So you would ignore both of these terms. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, you can just not tune it to zero, in which case it will just automatically go to infinity and that defines another C of T. So these are two different C of Ts. Um, so I mentioned how there's this chern simons term. Uh, so what's special about this term is that its coefficient k must be an integer, uh, which is basically required uh, by large gauge transformations. Um, and there's a certain terminology people use when the chern simons level is zero. This is called the CPN model. So, so that's the name for this scalar QED3 C of T. Um, so, so I've described in detail uh, what the action looks like for scalar QED3. Um, the action for fermionic QED3 is very similar, except you'll just have um, fermions instead of scalars, but everything else will look exactly the same. And um, another difference is that the number of fermions must be even in order to avoid the parity anomaly, which is something you don't, which doesn't show up in the scalar case. Um, I, another kind of general difference between the scalar and fermionic case is that I mentioned on the very first slide that uh, fermionic QED3 is believed to confine for some small value of n, and when confinement happens, then you, then you do not flow to a C of T. And so th this possibility of confinement only happens for fermionic QED3. For scalar QED3, there's no question of confinement and the theory is believed to be a C of T just for any value of n. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is the definition of QED3 where I've written down a very explicit action in 3D. Uh, now let's discuss the operators that appear in this theory. So firstly, you can construct operators out of the fields that appear in the Lagrangian, um, which is the usual thing you know, people do in quantum field theory. So for instance, in scalar QED3, we have scalars phi, we have a gauge field A of which we make the field strength F. And so we can just construct gauge invariant operators out of this F and phi. Or if in the case of fermionic QED3, 
out of the fermion psi. And so these operators will generically transform under the SUN flavor symmetry because the scalars and the fermions transform themselves in the fundamental of the flavor symmetry. So you can then just compute um, uh, the quantum numbers of these operators um, in the large n expansion using Feynman diagrams because the theory is weakly coupled to large n. Um, so this has been done uh, by many authors, um, originally in a classic paper by Colin Sashtev, and I also had a paper a few years ago, uh, and many other people have studied um, you know, correlation functions of these operators at large. Um, but these aren't the operators we're going to be mostly concerned about in this talk, because we're going to be concerned about monopole operators. So it turns out that in addition to the SUN flavor symmetry, there is in fact another global symmetry, which is called U1T, where T stands for topological. And the reason why you have this global symmetry is that because you have a gauge field, you can write down the field strength of F, and then you can define a current as the Hodge dual of F, where the Hodge dual just means you contract with le this levy civita tensor. So this current J is always conserved because there's something called the Bianchi identity, which is just a mathematical identity, which says that if you take a derivative of a levy civita tensor with the field strength, then you get zero. And so, and if you have a conserved current, that means by definition, you have to have a continuous global symmetry corresponding to that current. And so that's why we have this U1T. So because we now have this other uh, global symmetry U1, you can just define an operator which is charged under that U1. So in particular, we define monopole operators with charge Q as having charge Q under this U1T global symmetry. In particular, this means that if you take an integral of the field strength around a circle S2, then you will get four pi Q. So there's a couple of basic properties. So first of all, there's something called the Dirac quantization condition, which requires that this Q be half integer. This is in order to avoid a Dirac string, which would otherwise show up for the monopole operator. Um, another thing is that all the operators which you would define from fields in the Lagrangian, such as scalars, fermions, or the field strength, all of those operators are uncharged under this U1T. So the only thing which is charged under it are monopole operators, no, nothing else. And that's why it's a bit mysterious, you know, because like, of course, monopole operators don't show up in the action, but nonetheless, they appear in the theory. Um, another thing which makes monopole operators, you know, um, difficult to study is that because they don't show up in the Lagrangian, it's very hard to compute their quantum numbers, such as their scaling dimensions on R3. So I should note that the original paper on monopole operators, going back to like the 90s by Murthy and Sashtev, did attempt to compute their scaling dimensions in R3, but they had to do all kinds of crazy tricks in order to do that. And I, I'm going to introduce a much simpler method, which was developed later uh, by Kapusta. Um, OK, so, so before I move on, is the definition of the monopole operator clear to everybody? Um, OK, so I, I, I'll take that as a yes. Um, OK, so, so now let me just give a brief outline of the remainder of this talk. So I'm going to discuss properties of monopole operators from several approaches. So first, I'm going to consider the large n expansion, uh, which in the case of a turn simons level, we should think of as large n or large k. Uh, so the large n expansion of the free energy at fixed kappa, which is the ratio of the turn simons level and n, and I'm going to compute this free energy on S2 cross S1, where the S1 has length beta. So you can think of beta as the inverse temperature. Um, I, I'm going to use this free energy calculation to compute the scaling dimension to subleading order in 1 over n where recall from the previous slide that the scaling dimension of an operator in R3 is the same thing as the energy on S2 cross R. And that's why I'm considering this S2 cross S1, because in the limit of beta goes to infinity, this is S2 cross R. Um, I'm also going to show um, the transformation of monopole operators under the SUN flavor symmetry. And in particular, I'm going to show that there's a large degeneracy at leading order at large n. I'm then going to consider a different method of computing the monopole operator scaling dimension. Uh, which works at finite n, and this is called the four minus epsilon expansion, which I'll explain in detail later. Um, finally, I'm going to compare the results of these perturbative methods to non-perturbative methods. Uh, so finite n and exactly in 3D. In particular, I'm going to compare the results to lattice simulations, as well as the numerical conformal bootstrap. And then finally, with the remaining time, I hope to compare to expectations from this 3D web of dualities that I mentioned. Um, OK, great. Um, so let's just jump right in with the large n calculations of QED3 on S2 cross S1. So as I mentioned before, CFTs have something called the state operator correspondence that relate the scaling dimension of operators in R3 to the energy on S2 cross R1. So we can use this to compute the scaling dimension of a monopole. 
because we just apply this principle to the monopole, which is just another local operator. And that means that the scaling dimension of the monopole is the same thing as the energy on the S2 Hilbert space with four pi Q magnetic flux on S2 cross R. Um, so this was the basic idea in the classic paper by Kapustin as, as well as his students. And that's what we're gonna be following in this talk. Um, what one novelty we're gonna deal with though, which Kapustin did not discuss is having a Chern-Simons term. So a Chern-Simons term contributes 2QK to the Gauss law constraint because basically the Chern-Simons term contributes magnetic flux. Um, and so this means that the vacuum on S2 cross R will no longer be gauge invariant because of this extra flux coming from the Chern-Simons term. And so that means we're gonna have to dress the vacuum with matter fields in order to make it gauge invariant. Okay, so in particular, we're gonna compute the thermal free energy uh, which is just the free energy on S2 cross S1, where it's thermal because we interpret this beta as inverse temperature. Um, and uh, this was done in a paper with uh, these collaborators a couple of years ago. Um, the way we do this calculation is that we integrate out the matter, and then we're going to find that the action is in a scale like n, which will allow us to use a large n saddle point um, to compute uh, this free energy. And in particular, um, there's gonna be hol a holonomy on S1 of the gauge field. And this is gonna act as a chemical potential for the matter, which will be fixed by the saddle condition in order to cancel the gauge charge. So this might sound like a mouthful, but in the next few slides, I'm gonna explain very step-by-step -step how this process works. But the general idea is just that in this path integral approach, we don't have to dress the vacuum by hand. Instead, it happens automatically from our saddle point calculation, which is what's nice about it. Um, as a bonus of computing the free energy on this uh, S2 cross S1, uh, the subleading and temperature terms are going to tell us the degeneracy of states, because this subleading term is just the entropy. Um, and so this is going to tell us about the possible representations of the monopole operator. Okay, so, so here I, I've I have, outlined the- I have a question. Sure. Uh, so uh, the state of operator correspondence is, uh, doesn't it really, doesn't it deal with uh, local operators, strictly yes. speaking? A monopole yes. operator is not a- No, it is local. local. It is local. Yeah, so uh, I mean, so like, yeah, because like the monopole operator is defined as a local operator, which is charged under this U1 topological symmetry. But but you don't have to call it a topological symmetry. It's just, just a U1 symmetry. Like, it doesn't matter where it came from. So it's, it's a standard U1 symmetry, and monopole operators, by definition, are just operators charged, local operators charged under the symmetry. But- I mean, if it has, I'm guessing it has magnetic charge, so it has non-trivial Dirac pairing with all local fields in the Lagrangian, how can it be a local field? No, okay, so, so you should be careful to distinguish these monopole operators from monopoles that you might be familiar with in four dimensions. So this is very confusing because right. people use the same word for both, but they have nothing to do with each other. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, so this, I'm sorry, I didn't make up the notation. Uh, they're both monopoles in the sense that they have a pole. <laughs> so, so they're both objects with one pole, but that's the only similarity between them. Like, you know, a more useful word for monopole operators might be instanton operators, because they're more like an instanton in the sense that they are defined at one point in space and time, because they're local operators. Right, okay. Okay, great, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, 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 yeah, the other question is, uh, when you say that you want to make the vacuum gauge invariant, uh, you, you address, it, it, it stops to be gauge invariant only with the large, large gauge transformations or also, no, 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 no. So, okay, so, so I mean, this aspect of lack of gauge invariance, this is just conventional, just local gauge transformations would make it okay. gauge dependent. Um, okay. But yeah, so yeah, so I mean, this is different. I mean, like the large gauge transformations, I won't talk about that in this talk because that's just relevant if you want to prove that K is an integer. But for all the calculations I'm doing, that's, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions? Um, okay, great. So, okay, so I will move on. Um, Okay, so, so let's get into the details of this calculation I just, I just outlined. So you start by taking the path integral on the previous slide and you do the path integral over the scalars phi. And because the action was quadratic in phi, we can do that exactly because it's just a Gaussian integral. Um, so the result of, of integrating out these scalars phi is that we're gonna get a trace log term which involves the operator that was in the quadratic in phi terms. So this was just the, you know, the operator in the kinetic term and then remember sigma coupled to phi squared, that's why we get sigma. And then this a quarter is just because on S2 cross R, there's something called the conformal mass. And so that's what this quarter is. Um, note that the chern simons term just stays exactly how it was. So we haven't done anything to it because, because the chern simons term didn't couple to the phi's. 
Um, so one thing you'll notice is that after integrating out the matter, now you see that the entire action is proportional to n. And so that means we can compute the path integral for the other fields, i.e. the gauge field A and the hubbard sutanovich field sigma by a saddle point approximation, order by order in one over n. So let's consider the most general saddle point for the gauge field A and the hubbard sutanovich field sigma, which respects the symmetries of S2 cross S1 and also has four pi Q magnetic flux. So, so this is the most general saddle point you can write down. Um, so for a uh, sigma, the saddle is just a number mu, which we'll fix in a moment. Um, whereas for the gauge field A, the saddle is a bit more complicated. So, so in the theta and phi directions on this S2, it takes the following form. So it's Q sine theta and then D theta wedge D phi. And then in the tau direction, which is the direction of this S1, it's just a constant alpha, which you can also think of. So this is called the the holonomy. And the reason why it's called the holonomy is that you can think of it as the integral of the gauge fields over the circle S1, and then divided by beta. Um, OK, so, so this is just an onsatz for the saddle point. But, but, but we haven't actually fixed the explicit values of this alpha or this mu yet. So, so let's just start by plugging in this onsatz for the saddle point into the partition function. And this gives us the leading large n contribution to the partition function. And so, so very explicitly, after plugging in the saddle, um, we can just compute this trace log of this operator, because this is just computing the spectrum on S2 cross S1 um, in the presence of uh, a gauge field with 4 pi Q flux. Um, and so you can just compute the spectrum. So in particular, you sum up the eigenvalues times their degeneracies. And that's what we have on the second line. So it's a sum. Um, the specific values of the eigenvalues and degeneracies I'll give in, in a following slide, but for now, you can just think of them as numbers. Um, and then this 2 kappa QA came from the Chern-Simons term, because I just plugged in the saddle point value of A into the Chern-Simons term, and you get this. And so you see here, kappa shows up there. Uh, great. Um, so, so far, we now have the leading order free energy as a function of alpha and mu, which we have not yet fixed yet. So alpha and mu are just constants. So in order to fix alpha and mu, these will be fixed from the saddle point equations. So in order to for it to be a saddle, as usual, that means if you take a derivative in terms of these values, it has to be 0. So we can solve for these saddle point equations. So let's first solve for alpha. So if you solve for alpha, you will find that up to exponentially small in temperature terms, there's a unique saddle point, which takes the following form. So um, it depends on the sign of kappa, which is the turn simons level. And then the first term is just this energy eigenvalue, uh, lambda. Um, uh, specifically for j equals q. And then the second term, um, I will give a more physical explanation in the following slides. But for now, just note that it's down by 1 over temperature. Uh, and c is just defined right here in terms of q and kappa. So the saddle point equation for mu um, is a bit more complicated. So it takes the following form. So you have this infinite sum. Uh, this sum is formally divergent, but you can regularize it using zeta functions, um, which is a standard method. Um, you can also regularize it using other regularization schemes. They all give the same answer. And here, as promised, I show you the explicit formulas for what these eigenvalues and degeneracies look like. So as you see, they take a very simple form. Um, the reason I'm showing you this formula is I want you to notice that in the definition of this eigenvalue, um, mu and q squared appear in a very simple way, and one of them has a minus sign relative to the other one. And so uh, this means there's a possibility of them canceling. So if mu were to equal q squared, then the eigenvalue would, would simplify, and then it would just be j plus half. And so it turns out that there is a specific scenario where this cancellation does happen. So if the value of the turn simons level kappa happens to be precisely dq, where dq is just 2q plus 1, then it turns out the solution to this saddle point equation is mu equals q squared. So in that case, all the formulas simplify. Um, if kappa does not equal this specific value, which is the more generic case, then the answer you just solve numerically, and it's something messier. Um, but this simplicity you know, will show up uh, throughout the talk. So that's why I wanted to emphasize it right now. Um, OK, great. So we can now just plug in the values of the saddle point values of alpha and mu um, into the free energy written right here in terms of the sum. And then we can just compute and, and, and see what we get. So after plugging it in, we're going to get an answer for the free energy, um, which we can expand at, excuse me, which we can expand at large n. Um, so the leading term is going to scale like n, 
and then the sublinear term will go like n to the zero, et cetera. And then for each term in this large n expansion, we can furthermore expand in the temperature one over beta. And then the leading term is going to be the energy, which remember is what we identify with the scaling dimension according to state operator correspondence. The subleading term will be the entropy as usual. And then it turns out there are no further subleading terms except for exponentially small ones, which we don't care about. Um, okay. So let's first talk about this scaling dimension, which will be the leading temperature independent term at each order in one over n. And in particular, let's talk about the leading order in large n, which scales like n. So from the formula on the previous page, after plugging in the saddle point values, you get this, this, this is the final answer. So the final answer is an infinite sum of degeneracies times eigenvalues plus a specific eigenvalue, so the eigenvalue of, of j equals q, times this degeneracy times c. Remember, c was written in terms of this d and lambda. And then the answer for the entropy also takes this relatively simple form. So while these forms are simple, to actually compute them explicitly for a given value of q involves, again, doing zeta function regularization. And generically, the answer you get will just be some number, because you have to do it numerically. There, there's one exception, though, which is that when 2 kappa equals dq, which recall was the case when the saddle point value of mu canceled uh, the q squared, then you actually find that um, this sum takes a very simple form. So in particular, you're going to find that this sum is actually going to regularize to 0. And then the contribution is just going to come from this term. And then the answer is going to take this very simple exact form. So um, you can think of this, if you want, as like a sum of n squared from n from 0 to 2q. And so in particular, if you look at the lowest monopole operator, which is q equals half, then you find that this delta just equals 1, which is a, a, a very simple answer in, in, the, in this specific case, when 2 kappa equals dq. Um, OK. And so this intriguing simplicity is something we're going to comment on uh, later in the talk. Um, OK. So we just discussed leading order in large n. Um, now we can go to uh, subleading order. Um, so the subleading order calculation is very complicated, so I'm not going to discuss it in detail, but I just want to flesh it out for you. So the idea is that, as in any saddle point approximation, if you want to go to the next order, you have to compute the quadratic fluctuations around the saddle. Um, so this is what this would look like. So here you see there's three kinds of quadratic terms. Either you can have quadratic in the gauge field, quadratic in this hubbard svetonovich field, or some mixed term. And then these k's are just the kernels that multiply the quadratic terms. Um, there's a subtlety, which is that because this is a gauge theory, and because we haven't fixed the gauge, that means there would be infinities coming from integrating over the gauge modes, which are divergent. And so a way to kind of cancel out those infinities is simply to uh, subtract the answer at q equals 0 from the answer at finite q. Because these, these divergences are the exact same case regardless of q, and so this is just a convenient way of getting rid of them, is to, is to subtract these two answers. Um, OK. So these kernels, uh, more explicitly, are written in terms of the Green's functions of the scalar, which is defined in the usual way. So it's just whatever the operator acting on the quadratic term was um, equaling a delta function. Um, so um, in this paper with my collaborators, we computed this thermal Green's function for arbitrary q. And the answer was written as some like very complicated infinite sum of monopole spherical harmonics, where monopole spherical harmonics are the same thing as regular spherical harmonics except now you have extra magnetic flux due to the monopole charge. Uh, but they're just, they're just mathematical objects you can write down. Um, I should note that, again, in the case of 2 cap equals dq, it turns out that you can simplify this Green's function. You can actually write it in a closed form, which is something I did in my recent paper. Um, OK. Um, so what you do is you compute this Green's function. You plug it into this kernel. You, and you just you know, turn the crank. It's very complicated, but you can just get an explicit answer for the free energy at subleading order in 1 over n. So the answer you get at the end of the day, up to exponentially small in temperature terms, takes the following form. So you have the leading in temperature term, which we identify as the subleading in 1 over n correction to the scaling dimension. And then you have a term which is down by temperature, um, which takes the following form. And you see. It's a little bit funny, because you see there's a log beta term here. So you have log temperature over temperature. Um, and then you also have other terms that don't depend on log beta. Um, so uh, this might seem a little bit mysterious, but in the next couple slides, I'm going to give an interpretation of why we get this answer. So in terms of showing explicit results, so this subleading scaling dimension was computed for the zero turn Simons level case, but for general Q in this paper uh, by these authors. 
And then in my recent uh, paper, I computed it for the specific case of two cap equals dq and q equals half, in which case the calculation has a lot of simplifications uh, you know, for the reasons mentioned. So in both cases, you get the following answer. So in the cap equals zero case for q equals half, you get what's essentially some you know, random number times n, because you had to compute it numerically. And then here's the subleading correction. Um, in this simpler case of two cap equals dq when q equals half, uh, then you find that the leading answer is just n. Uh, and then the subleading answer is this number, which unfortunately is not zero. Um, another kind of fun fact I should mention is that um, you can compute these scaling dimensions for any q. And so in particular, you could consider the large q limit. So, so this was computed in a paper by De La Fuente um, in Canada, I should add. And um, it turns out that if you compute it at large Q, you can look at the Q to the zero term. And there is a general prediction for what this Q to the zero term should look like based on something called the large charge expansion, um, which is a recent idea in high energy physics that like you should be able to compute uh, scaling dimensions in CFTs as an expansion in a charge under a certain continuous global symmetry. And so because this U1T is a continuous global symmetry, this large Q corresponds to the large charge expansion. And there was a prediction. And in fact, it matches. So this is a very nice check on this calculation. OK, so, so now I've shown the answer from this path integral calculation, which was just a thermal calculation. So you could, you could think of this as macro-canonical. In the following slides, I'm going to give a micro-canonical interpretation for the answer we saw. Um, OK, so this is a conjectured microcanonical interpretation. The reason why is that to give a microcanonical interpretation, i.e. using an oscillator construction, you would want to deal with variables that are well-defined in the UV. So the UV is when E squared times N goes to 0, because it's because you're looking at weakly coupled. You know, So when the coupling to the gauge field is very small. On the other hand, though, the CFT we're interested in is defined in the IR, which is when E squared times N goes to infinity. Um, and so it's not totally obvious that this oscillator construction, which is valid in the UV, should also apply to the IR. On the other hand, though, it's a general expectation in quantum field theory that unless you have level crossing, it should be the case that the states in the UV should be the same as the states in the IR. And, and usually level crossing doesn't occur. So I should say that while this is conjectural, I think there's good reason to believe that this oscillator construction makes sense. And indeed, based on matching it to these rigorous um, thermal results, I think you know, there's a lot of reason to think it makes sense. OK, so, so let's move on to the oscillator construction. So for scalar QED3, we expand phi in modes on Lorentzian S2 cross R. So, so here are the modes. Um, so as usual, uh, for a scalar field, we expand it in two kinds of modes, because it's a complex scalar field. So this is A and B. And then we have the vacuum on S2 cross R, which is what I call M bare. So this is like the bare monopole. So the, these modes, they have the energy lambda j, where lambda was just the energy eigenvalue I introduced in previous slides. And the energy of the vacuum is just the Casimir energy. So you just sum up all energies times their degeneracies. Um, these modes um, have spin, you know, as, this, as this j suggests, whereas the vacuum, of course, is a singlet. Uh, the modes have gauge charge, because these scalar fields are charged under the gauge symmetry. And also, the bare vacuum also has a gauge charge when the churn simons level is non-zero. Because as mentioned, the Chern Simons term induces a magnetic flux. Um, in terms of SUN representations, the vacuum is invariant, whereas the modes transform. And then finally, the vacuum is, of course, non degenerate, whereas these modes are degenerate. I should note that this eigenvalue, as shown on previous slides, actually depends on mu, which is the saddle point of the quartic term. So I should, so these phi modes, they're not really free modes. It doesn't correspond to free theory. Instead, you should think of it as a mean field like theory. OK, so, so now let's recall the answer we got at leading order at large n. So we got this answer, which we know is correct. And now let's interpret it from this oscillator construction. So you can think of this first term as just the Casimir energy of the bare monopole, you know, uh, based on the table from the previous slide. The second term we can think of as the lowest energy LQ mode, because remember that you know, we have modes for every j where j starts at q. And so LQ is, lambda q is the lowest one. And so these are exactly the number of scalar modes we needed in order to cancel the gauge charge. So remember that this bare um, monopole had this 2QN kappa gauge charge. And so we have to add however many uh, scalar modes to cancel this gauge charge. And that's exactly how you get this term. 
So just the contribution of energy from canceling the gauge charge. So after dressing this bare vacuum with all these scalars, um, now your state is going to transform under the SUN symmetry because all these modes themselves transform. And so in particular, there, um, you get a degenerate representation under the flavor symmetry as well as the rotational symmetry. And so I'll give you an example. In the case of dq equals 2, um, then the degenerate states take the following form. So, so you get um, states going from spin equals 0 to n xc, um, where 2 l plus 1 corresponds to the dimension of the spin. It's where l is the spin. And then r l is the representation under sun, which is given by the following Young tableau. And so, as you see, you get many different representations, which all have the same energy. So they are degenerate at leading order and large n. And so what's a nice check on this proposal is that if you take the logarithm of these representations, of this degenerate representation, then this exactly reproduces this entropy that we found. Um, and so um, as you see, this microcanonical interpretation seems to exactly match with the thermal answer we got. And, and so one of the surprises for us was the fact that there was many monopole operators which have the same scaling dimension, um, because this wasn't known prior to this work. OK, so, so that's the microcanonical explanation at leading order. Um, at subleading order, it's a bit more subtle. So because we already know that there are degenerate uh, states at leading order and large n, and n's going to infinity, that means in some sense there should be a continuum of states at leading order and large n. So, so let's conjecture a continuous density of states. So this is just given by some number c times e minus e naught, where e naught is the ground state, uh, to the power of some number alpha. And so, and so let's look at what you would get from such a continuous density of states at large n. So if you just write down the definition of your free energy in terms of this conjecture density of states, and you do this integral, then you would get the following form in this small temperature expansion. So the leading term would be the ground state energy, and then you would get a log beta over beta term, as well as just inverse beta terms. And so here you see that when the fact that you see a log beta over beta is a smoking gun for the fact that you have a continuous density of states. Because if you had a discrete density of states, you would not see a log beta over beta. You would just get the conventional entropy. Um, OK, so, so now we can compare this conjectured uh, density of states, which is just an ansatz. So we can compare this ansatz for the density of states to um, the explicit answer that we got for the free energy at subleading order in 1 over n. We're, we're, I'm going gonna, gonna to specify to the case dq equals 2 for simplicity. So in that case, we find that this ansatz, you can fix these numbers c and alpha to get the following form. So the ground state energy, as expected, is just the scaling dimension at leading order and subleading order. Uh, this constant c turns out to be fixed in terms of these other variables. And then this uh, alpha turns out just to be 1 half in this case. So, so OK, so so far we fixed the continuous density of states from our thermal answer. And now let's compare this to what we would get from our microcanonical interpretation in terms of oscillators. So in particular, the microcanonical interpretation is that you have these degenerate states and certain representations. So you can write down a continuous density of state that would correspond to having operators in all these degenerate representations. And so by definition, it would just be the dimension of the, of the representation. So for spin L, you have 2L plus 1, and you have the dimension of the SUN representation. And this is divided by the difference in energy depending on spin. And so just evaluating this at large n, you would get the following answer for the continuous density of states. So now you can relate this microcanonical ansatz for the continuous density of states to the macrocanonical ansatz of the density of states. And so you have a differential equation in this uh, spin, or, or specifically y, which is spin rescaled by n. You solve the differential equation, and you, for the, you get the answer for the energy, which is, gives the following form. So you have the usual terms, which is just the scaling dimensions. Um, sorry, this is a typo. This should be plus, uh, not minus. Um, and then the interesting thing is that you get an energy splitting term, which says how these degenerate states will be split at subleading order in 1 over n. So that, so so because remember, this y is just the spin rescaled by square root of n. And so what this means is that because this number c is something you can just read off from the thermal answer, because like the c is basically something that just appeared at order um, 1 over beta, this allows you to compute the energy splitting of these degenerate states. So in particular, for the case q equals half and kappa equals 1, I computed this in my recent paper, and I got the following answer. Um, and so in principle, you know, if people were to, say, study uh, these monopole operators in an experiment, 
um, you would be able to compare this energy splitting to like the different monopole operators uh, they would see. Um, okay, so, so this concludes the story for scalar QED3 at large n. So before I talk about fermionic QED3, are there any questions? Um, uh, okay, great. Okay, so, so now let me briefly talk about the story for fermionic QED3. So, so this works very similar as the scalar case. Um, so again, you just do a saddle point approximation and you fix the values of the holonomy from the saddle point. Um, the only difference is that now there are many possible saddle points you could find um, as a function of kappa. Um, and the way you choose a specific uh, saddle point is just by demanding that it be give a real free energy. And so it turns out that there will be a different saddle point depending on kappa. So in the scalar case, there was just the same saddle point for every value of kappa. Now the saddle point changes. But this has a very nice physical explanation because this corresponds to Landau levels. So basically, every different saddle point will correspond to a different Landau level. And so when you plug in the saddle point and compute the scaling dimension in leading order in large n, you get this term, which is like a Casimir energy. You get this term, which corresponds to filled Landau levels. And then you get the final term, which corresponds to how many um, uh, eigenvalues you have of fermionic modes in the valence Landau level. And then, then this is what you get for the entropy. Um, OK, so this is what I just explained. Um, so, um, so this also has the very natural microcanonical interpretation. Um, and so just to, to make another comparison, in the scalar case, remember that we got a Casimir energy plus just however many lowest scalar modes were sufficient to cancel the gauge charge. And that's because with bosons, you know, it's, it's almost kind of like uh, both Einstein condensate, where you can just have like as many lowest energy modes as you want. But with fermions, you're not allowed to have unlimited lowest energy modes because you know they're fermions and so you have Landau levels. Um, so another interesting difference between the fermionic case and the scalar case is that in the fermionic case, um, it turns out that this the, the bare uh, monopole, which corresponds just to the bare vacuum on S2 cross R, has a gauge charge even when you don't have any churn simons level. So even when kappa is zero, you would still this would still be gauge dependent because you have fermionic zero modes which are gauge dependent and which contribute to the vacuum. And so this means that we had to dress with fermions even in the case of zero turn simons level. So this is unlike the scalar case where when the turn simon level was zero, we didn't have to dress with scalars. Um, so again, similar to the scalar case, um, the entropy that we find exactly matches this microcanonical interpretation. So this is the entropy which corresponds to having these, this n psi d lambda valence um, fermions dressing the vacuum in order to make it gauge invariant. And again, this leads to energy splitting, which you can compute in the analogous way. OK, so, so this concludes the large n calculation part of my talk. Um, so um, I guess unless there's any questions, uh, I will move, move on to the second method of how to compute the scaling dimension of a monopole operator, which is uh, for finite n, but using something called the 4 minus epsilon expansion. Um, OK. So I, I'll begin by noting that if, you're if you want to compute the scaling dimension of fields that show up in Lagrangian, so like more conventional operators, then these have been studied in the epsilon expansion at finite n only very recently in a paper by these authors in the last few years. This is in contrast to say, P if you wanted to study, say, the icing model with the epsilon expansion. So that you know, goes back, I think, to the 70s. So for whatever reason, it's much harder to study QED3 in the epsilon expansion than it is for simpler theories like the icing model. Also. I'm only going to be discussing fermionic QED3 because for scalar QED3, um, when you are computing it in the four minus epsilon expansion, it turns out you only have a CFT for n bigger than 183. And so that basically what that means is that the epsilon expansion isn't very useful for scalar QED3. Um, anyways, um, so how are we going to define our monopole operator in general dimensions D? And so this is the definition we have. So for general space time dimension D, you can always define the topological current Hodge F. So, so remember that in previous slides, I said how because you have a, a gauge field, that means you can write down this Levy Civita tensor with an F. So the way you generalize that to general spacetime dimension is you just write it as the Hodge dual. And this is a conserved D minus three form, which by definition couples to co dimension three defect operators in the sense uh, defined by these authors. Uh, and so that means you just, this monopole operator is just a co dimension three defect operator with four pi q flux. And so in particular, if the dimension is three, that means it's just a local operator. 
But if the dimension is bigger than three, then it's no longer a local operator. So in particular, if the dimension is four, it becomes a line operator. And then for dimensions in between three and four, you know, it's some operator which is in between a line operator and a local operator. Um, so, so, so that was our general approach in this paper is that we compute the scaling dimension um, by conformally mapping R4 minus epsilon to the cylinder in the presence of, the, of this defect on R1 minus epsilon. And then we compute the free energy on the cylinder, um, which in the presence of this defect corresponds to S2 cross hyperbolic space of dimension two minus epsilon. So the reason why this, this uh, definition has a natural motivation is that in 3D, i.e. when epsilon equals one, then this just corresponds to S2 cross R, and this is just the standard state operator argument for the scaling dimension of the local monopole operator. But then in the other limit of epsilon equals to zero, so i.e. in four dimensions, um, this free energy calculation gives something called the scaling weight of the tuft line operator, which is the natural four-dimensional generalization of this monopole operator. So someone asked the question before, they, you know, they said like, oh, is there any similarity between the monopole operators I'm discussing and like, you know, monopoles in four dimensions? And the answer is that there's no similarity. They're, they're different concepts. Instead, the natural four-dimensional version of the monopole operators I'm describing are in fact line operators. So in four dimensions, they are not local operators. So in this paper where we did the Sepsilon expansion, we were computing the free energy of a non-local operator. And then we were extrapolating to epsilon equals one, in which case it becomes the local monopole operator. Um, okay, so just to give a few more details. So when you're computing this in the epsilon expansion, so epsilon is proportional to E squared. Um, and so that means you can uh, expand um, uh, this free energy at small E squared, which corresponds to small epsilon. And so the free energy will take the following form. So you're going to get a one over epsilon term, and then a constant in epsilon, and then corrections. So in our paper, we computed the classical term, which is the one that is divided by epsilon, and we also computed the one loop term. Um, and we, it turns out that the answer we got uh, commutes with the large n expansion. So this was a consistency check that you can do either epsilon expansion and then large n, or vice versa, and you get the same answer. Um, unfortunately, in order to make a precise numerical comparison, um, I think we would need one extra term because like usually what people do when they do the epsilon expansion is that they compute a few terms and they do a pa day resummation. But the thing is, because we only have two terms, we couldn't do a pa day resummation. Um, and so this is still kind of a, a program, which you know, I think needs a couple more orders in order for it to reach uh, completion. But, but one result we do have already is that you could look at the large Q version of our result, in which case, um, based on this large charge expansion and just dimensional analysis, they expect that it should scale like q to the four minus epsilon over two. And the explicit answer we got at large q takes this form, which is consistent with a small epsilon expansion of q to the four minus epsilon over two. Um, unfortunately, there's no unique way of resumming our answer into the finite epsilon answer, um, at, least with the, at least with just two terms in the epsilon expansion. It's conceivable that if we had more terms in the epsilon expansion, then we could perhaps motivate some unique way of resumming and then we could kind of like guess, you know, the finite epsilon answer more easily. Okay, so, so this concludes my brief discussion of the epsilon expansion. Um, and so now I'm gonna move on to non-perturbative results about monopole operator quantum numbers. Um, so in, in the remaining last few minutes. Okay, so let's start with a, a result from the lattice. Um, so here was a lattice study for scalar QED3 with zero turn Simons level. Uh, and very nicely you see that these lattice results match the large n result, which is this blue dotted line. And the match is even for very small values of n. So this is a very nice check of the large n method. Um, there are also uh, lattice results for fermionic QED3, which are more recent. And so here, here are the results they get. If you compare this to large n, you see that at large n it matches, which it had to, but at small n it doesn't match as well. And so this is kind of a mystery of why you know, lattice and large n worked better for the scalar case, but not so good for the fermionic case. Although for n equals four, the comparison is still pretty good. Um, okay, so now moving on to another non-perturbative method. So there's something called the numerical bootstrap, which is something I work on. And in a paper a few years ago, we applied the numerical bootstrap to QED3 with zero turn Simons level. And so this is a result we got. So in this plot, the x-axis is the scaling dimension of the lowest monopole operator with Q equals half. And the y-axis is the scaling dimension of the second lowest operator with monopole operator with Q equals one. And so there's various curves here, and these curves correspond to uh, different assumptions we made about the non-monopole spectrum. 
which is, and we needed to make these assumptions in order to get an interesting result. Um, and so the way you could think about this is that we put in one assumption and then we compared it to two numbers, which is, you know, delta M1 and delta M half. And the non-trivial result is that when we tuned this gap assumption to a certain value, i.e. two, then we found a kink in this plot, which seemed to match the scaling dimensions of both of these numbers. So the idea is that we put in one number, but we got out two numbers. And so that, that was kind of the non-trivial match. Um, so of course, though, uh, one of the results of the large n calculation is that we learned that at least at large n, there are several monopole operators in different representations that should have roughly the same scaling dimension. So here in this plot, um, for m half, there's just a unique operator. But for m1, there should actually be different monopole operators. And I was just showing you a certain representation. So in this next plot, I show you results for other representations. So the solid line, so the solid brown, red, and black line correspond to all the monopole operators that should have roughly the same scaling dimension. And at this kink, which is where we think the theory lives, indeed, they seem to have roughly similar values. This is to be contrasted with the dotted lines, which correspond to monopole operators and representations that we do not expect to have the same leading large n and scaling dimension. And these are much higher. So the point is that we get some you know, very rough qualitative uh, evidence from the bootstrap for this degeneracy at large n that we observed analytically. OK, so um, in, in my remaining last few minutes, I want to briefly talk about the relationship to this web of dualities. So, so let's start with the simplest uh, duality, uh, which is between um, scalar QED3 with zero term Simons level and just the critical O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point. So this goes back, I think, to the 70s and 80s. This is a classic duality in the condensed matter literature. Um, and in this duality, you relate the lowest dimension monopole operator in scalar QED3 to the complex scalar field in this critical O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point, where in particular the global symmetries identify the O2 with the U1 um, global symmetry of scalar QED3. Because remember, this U1 topological symmetry is just a continuous global symmetry. Like it doesn't matter that it arose from this topological R. So this duality has been checked by many, many lattice simulations over the years. And so there's many reasons to believe it's true. You could try to compare this duality to these large n calculations. And there's actually kind of a nice match, which is that if you take the subleading in one over n calculation by these authors and you plug in n equals 1, then you find that the scaling dimension is 0 0.506. And this is very similar to the dual operator, which is just phi, which is known to have scaling dimension 0.519. And so this suggests that this large n calculation is valid even down to n equals 1 which perhaps shouldn't be so surprising because remember when I compared large n to Monte Carlo lattice results, it also seemed to match for small n. So it just seems that large n just works very well for scalar QED3 with zero churn signs. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about a different non-supersymmetric duality, which is much newer and, and more interesting. So this new duality relates scalar QED3 with non-zero churn Simons level. So in particular, K is one and the number of scalars is one. And this is supposed to be dual to just a free fermionic theory with one fermion. Um, so this was the recent duality by these authors. Um, I should note that this duality was inspired by some dualities for QCD3, first proposed by Ofer Haroni, my current advisor, which were checked in the large color limit in, in many different ways. So in, so in this duality, you know, going back to the main duality, in this duality, the lowest Q equal half monopole operator is supposed to be dual just to a free fermion. So that means the scaling dimension of this lowest monopole operator should simply be one. Um, so this is a conjecture duality. There's no quantitative checks yet because it's very hard to do lattice calculations for churn simons theory. So the only quantitative check I would say that really exists is if you compute the monopole operator at large n, which is what I did in, in my papers, then you find that at leading order in large n, the answer is just n. And so that means in particular, if you were to extrapolate that down to n equals one, the leading order answer would give you exactly the right answer, which is just one. And so the, I, this was very intriguing. And this is one of the things that motivated me to compute the subleading answer. But unfortunately, the subleading answer is not 0. Um, so of course, it didn't have to be 0 because I'm extrapolating large n to n equals 1. But whatever. I mean, it would have been nice if, if it was 0. Um, in fact, th there's, there's a little bit more um, uh, physical explanation of why you get such a simple answer at leading order. So in the microcanonical view, which is from the oscillator construction, it turns out that the Casimir energy contribution, which was like the infinite sum over eigenvalues and degeneracies, vanished for the specific case of q equals half and cap equals one. So the only contribution was from the single scalar mode that you needed to dress the bare monopole 
because it was gauge dependent uh, because of the turn Simon cell. And in particular, this single scalar mode in, in this case of Q equals half and cap equals one is transmuted into a fermion, which is just the usual story in two plus one dimensions where um, having a magnetic flux changes uh, bosons into fermions. And so you could see from the microcanonical perspective that you know you can kind of see how this duality is happening, where you see that kind of like you're having a scalar which turns into a fermion, and that's what gives the scaling dimension of the monopole operator, at, at least at, at leading. Okay, so so far I've discussed dualities when the number of flavors is small, in particular one, uh, but there are other conjecture dualities when the number of flavors is large, which is more relevant because that is the regime in which we do these large end calculations. So, so there is a duality that relates um, abelian QED3 with n fermions to so certain QCD theory, theory. In this case, the monopole would be related to a baryon in QCD3. Um, unfortunately, um, it's very hard to compute anything in QCD3, and indeed, we don't find any simplifications from our calculations. Um, there's a more speculative uh, duality, which relates scalar QED3 with turn Simon's level k equals n to another QCD3 theory. This is more speculative because it's believed to only hold not for all large n, but only n smaller than some n star. But under the speculative duality, the monopole operator should be related to a baryon in QCD3. And so in this dual pair, we found the leading order answer n. And so this would suggest that the baryon in this dual theory, um, its classical dimension does not get quantum corrections, leading order in large n. And so if someone could actually compute this baryon, then we would have a prediction for what it is. Although I don't know how to compute. Okay, so, 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 let, so let me conclude, because I'm a, a little bit over time. So we computed scaling dimensions at large end to subleading order in QED3 for theories with scalars, fermions, as well as turn simons level. Uh, we found a large descendancy of monopole operators in different representations at large end. We also computed it using the four minus epsilon expansion, and we also did some large uh, Q comparisons. Um, I also discussed non-perturbative results, both from the lattice as well as the numerical conformal bootstrap, which seem to confirm these, the, the results from the large n expansion, at least for the case of k equals zero, which is where these results exist. Um, I also found an intriguing simplicity in the large n calculation for the q equals half monopole and scalar qed3 with a certain value of k, um, which as mentioned, gives a possible relation to baryons in the dual qcd3 theory. So th there's many future directions. Um, so there's many other qed3 theories, uh, which you could compute to subleading order in one over n, and even to leading order in one over n. So, um, of course, you know, some of the people in the audience uh, were computing monopole operators in the chiral Heisenberg Gross Nouveau model uh, in leading order in one over n, but it'd be very nice to compute that at subleading order in one over n. Um, it would also be nice to do lattice studies of monopole operators with turn Simons coupling, because this would allow us to possibly have some very quantitative checks of these conjectured dualities. Similarly, it would be nice to apply the non perturbative conformal bootstrap to theories with non zero turn Simons level with the same motivation. Um, finally, I should note that um, you know, there's this general concept called ADS-CFT, which is that conformal field theories are dual to quantum gravity in anti sitter space. And so you might ask a question of like, well, what is the quantum gravity dual to QED3? And in an upcoming paper with my advisor and a fellow student and a grad student, we propose the precise gravity dual of QED3. And so this is a paper which will be coming out uh, in the next uh, month or so, and we actually have a full derivation of the gravity dual. Okay, so uh, that's it. Hey, thank you much, Shai. That was a very nice talk. Uh, a lot of material. Um, I have a few questions, but let me first let the audience ask questions. Um, so does anyone? Yeah, so um, maybe I can ask. Um, when you were talking about uh, this degeneracy lifting with the um, Lorentz spins, um, so you're working on this S2 cross S1 uh, space time. Um, how exactly do you interpret? So, so you were talking about. Uh, well, okay, 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 okay. So, so you, you should yeah. be careful. So, so the S2 cross S1 is the thermal calculation with the path integral. Yeah. So, so that, that's like the macro canonical calculation. The mm -hmm. micro canonical interpretation is S2 cross R. So you should think of just like okay, a Hilbert so space right. on S2 cross R. Mm -hmm. Okay, but still, like you interpret um, the results of your uh, of your computation using state operator correspondence as being yeah. monopoles with different Lorentz spins, right? Yes. And so, uh, if you go back on the other side of the correspondence, um, 
what is really the, the operator that you're, that you're studying then? Are you studying uh, a monopole that is a, a Lorentz scalar? Are your... No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So like, so like the monopole operators generically are not Lorentz scalars, but they don't have to be Lorentz scalars. Yeah. 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 So like, uh, I mean, like, like, I mean, the, their spin is just, you know, like what, what comes up in the calculation. So like, you know, as I said, like, you know, you get all different degenerate operators. They, and like, they have very specific spins, which are tied to their SUN representation. And my claim is that all those operators are large n of the same, of the same scaling energy. And so like the only case where the monopole is a scalar is basically for scalar QED3 with zero Chern Simons level. Uh, but the moment you have Chern Simons level or in fermionic QED3 generically, I would expect the monopole operator to not be a scalar. And, and this is required by the duality because you know, in, in these dualities, you know, oftentimes it's the case that you know, your, your, your dual operator is not a scalar. Now in the simplest dualities, it is a scalar, uh, but you know, there's other versions of these uh, dualities where the dual operator is not a scalar. So for instance, it's a fermion. So it's like you have a free fermion, which is dual to monopole operator. That means the monopole itself must have spin half. But um, so if you have non-zero churn Simon level, you could still um, fill all the modes in a given multiplet, or is that different for uh, for scalar theory? Um, okay, so so the difference in the scalar case and the fermionic case is in the scalar case you're always dressing with the lowest energy mode of the scalar. Mm -hmm. So you know, so like a scalar on on the sphere, of course, has you know infinite modes, you know, labeled by spherical harmonics, and like you're always just dressing with the lowest energy mode because you want to minimize the energy. And you're allowed to do that because it's a boson. But in the fermionic QED theory, in the fermionic theory, um, you would want to dress with the fermionic zero modes because those have zero energy. But because they're fermions, um, once you want, like you can only like fill up a certain lambda level. And like once you fill up that lambda level, you are forced to go to the next lambda level. Mm -hmm. The nice thing is that this this kind of this like this is an interpretation of a result which just automatically follows from the saddle point approximation. So like I didn't have to do this, do this by hand. So like I just did the thermal calculation. Uh, you know, just turning the crank, and then the answer I got, I could interpret in terms of lambda. Okay, thanks. So I think Robert has. A yeah, so I, I'm intrigued by the last point on the slide. So uh, it, in this gravity theory, what is what do the boundary monopoles correspond to? Um, okay, yes. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to go into huge detail on this because this is kind of a whole other subject. Um, but uh, so basically, I, I had a paper a couple months ago with uh, Ofer and Erez Erbach where we derived uh, the gravity dual of uh, a free theory as well as the critical uh, UN or ON models. Um, and so, in this upcoming paper, uh, because QED3 is basically a deformation of the free theory, it's a deformation by this um, basically by spin one operator, which is the current. Um, so basically, if you want to understand what the bulk looks like, you know, you can look at the paper we already came out with. In that paper, we describe very explicitly what the bulk theory looks like for the free theory. And then the bulk theory we're going to have for QD3 is that same bulk theory, except basically we change the boundary conditions of the spin one field in the bulk. Um, and so this, more specifically, your question about monopoles. Um, so the, the, the definition of monopole is like, it's, it's actually a bit simple because like, uh, I mean, like you define the monopole just in terms of the gauge field and the gauge field which you have in the bulk is the exact same gauge field you have in the CFT because the gauge field ends up living on the boundary. Um, and so like, I mean, I guess you could think of this monopole operator, um, if you would want to think of it, you know, on ADS, I guess it would be some, some like uh, configuration of the bulk fields, um, you know, such that, you know, when you integrate, uh, you get, you know, four pi q magnetic flux. Um, but, but like, I don't know, yeah, sorry. So I don't know how useful that explanation is. So could you view it as a string from the center to the boundary? Um, I don't know if, I, I don't think I would view it as a string because I, I, think, I think you would just view it as kind of like living on the boundary. Um, so like, like the, the, more, the more interesting operators, I mean, okay, so I mean, you should look at the paper, but like, I mean, like the, the way our duality works is that we map by local operators in the CFT, which are operators at two, point, two space time points to fields in the bulk. Um, and so, uh, whereas local operators in the CFT end up just being mapped to bulk fields on the boundary. So, so, uh, so, so they have a somewhat more trivial interpretation. And so the monopole operator, because it's a local operator in the CFT, it ends up just living on the boundary of ADS. Okay, thanks. Yeah. 
yeah, but yeah, but I, I'll give, you know, once the paper comes out, there'll be a much more extensive uh, explanation. But it's a, it's a higher spin yeah, theory in ADS, spin. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so this is higher spin quantum gravity, which I guess is, you know, okay. even more uh, non-realistic <laughs> than string theory. <laughs> but so people have done this for the Owen model, right? Polyakov and Klebanov. So, yeah, okay, so Polyakov and Klebanov uh, conjectured it. Uh, so in our paper, okay. we, we proved their conjecture. Um, so I, see. And I think, yeah, so our paper was the first paper to actually, I guess, explicitly derive um, this, this gravity dual. I see. Okay, so that's, that's, that's interesting. And then you use the same methods to find the, the dual for um, the gauged Wilson yeah. Fisher theory. Yeah, we use the same methods, you know, simply because QED3, you can think of it as just a deformation of the free theory. Mm -hmm. And can you, because the, the theory dual to QD3, scalar QD3, at least in the Wilson Fisher case, people have been able to do some one over n calculation using the, the Vasiliev theory and check yeah. them against the boundary yeah. result. In the case for scalar QD3, is it a more or less manageable theory or equally? Can well, so, you do so one of our end corrections in a book and you, you, so look, what you can basically show is that like if you've already shown the if you've already derived the duality for the free theory, then there's general arguments that show that all these correlation functions would have to automatically match for the uh, for deformations of the free theory. Um, so so like, this was basically argued in a paper by Witten originally. Um, so um, so like there's a paper by Witten where he basically says that like you know, the gauging an abelian uh, gauge group in the CFT is the same thing as just changing the boundary conditions of a spin one bulk field. And, and the way you change the boundary conditions kind of like automatically makes it such that all the correlation functions change to be what you would want for QED3. Um, th there's a very similar story comparing the free theory to the critical scalar theory. So like if you have the ON model, the free ON model and the critical ON model. So like going to the critical theory just corresponds to changing the boundary conditions of the bulk scalar field. And those boundary conditions are changed precisely so that all the free correlation functions now become critical um, theory correlation functions. So, so, so in the paper we already came out with, we show how that works for like the critical and free case. And in our upcoming paper, we're gonna show how that works also for QED3. Okay. Interesting. And are you aware of work in that direction by uh, Sensik Lee? I mean, he, he's been trying to also derive- So sorry, sorry, but by who I, I, I missed that. For very is the Sun Sick leak from uh, McMaster and Perimeter? I, I've seen papers He's by him. I, I, to be honest, I haven't read them, but I, I, I'm a, I know that he was doing stuff in that general direction, but I'm not familiar with the, 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 the details. Because it does remind me also of also this by local operators in the boundary being mapped to fields in the bulk. He was also having similar. Structures. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, so like the, the general, the general idea nice. of what we did was actually motivated by um, a guy named Javitsky, um, who's been working on like bilocals since the 70s. I mean, I think he was the one who introduced bilocals. Um, and so this idea has been floating around in the high energy community for many years that like bilocals should be related to bulk fields. So like, I mean, what we did is that we made this idea precise, uh, basically. So like, you know, we, we, wrote, we wrote the first like precise map. Cool. <laughs> so also it's a bit late, so I guess we can uh, thank Shai for the great seminar and those who want to maybe ask one quick question can stay, but uh, Shai, that was a very, very clear and very rich seminar. Thank you.